James, welcome back to the show. Hey, Stefan. It's great to be back. I think it's been uh, almost four years, huh? Damn. Yeah. Well, in terms of on the show, yeah. Uh, I've been yeah, yeah, you yeah. in person, you know, a couple of times, some of the conferences and things. Um, but uh, I know you've got this awesome proposal out. Um, and it looks pretty interesting to me. So, and, and I'm and I'm sure SLP listeners will be very interested to hear more about it. Um, so, do you want to just set the background for us? Like, where where did this where did this whole idea come from? Yeah, sure. So, um, I think everybody knows that custody in Bitcoin is really hard, and pretty much everybody's major fear around Bitcoin is waking up one day and you know checking your wallet and seeing that somebody's gotten away with your coins. Um, and so a lot of thought has been put into, you know, things that can mitigate the risk of, uh, of losing your coins. And um, especially kind of having experienced an industrial custody context uh, at a few different places, um, there's been an idea circulating for a while um, of this notion of a vault. And the idea of a vault is basically um, that you can lock up the coins in such a way that um, if you want to move them in general, you have to wait for this delay period. And during the delay period, you can kind of contest uh, the spend. Um, aside from uh, spending the coins into a pre-specified recovery path. Um, and so I think the first time that vaults were really discussed was in a paper um, I want to say in 2014 or 2015, um, it's a paper called Bitcoin Covenants, uh, written by Moser, um, Eyal and, uh, Eamon Gunsir. And, um, it's kind of an interesting paper because they, they formalize sort of the notion of Bitcoin covenants, which had been kind of mentioned by Greg Maxwell in a, in a Bitcoin talk post back in 2013. Um, uh, in, in actually a very derogatory context. But these guys formalize it into a paper, sort of. And it's a weird paper because they spend the first half talking about vaults and then, like, the second half talking about how they can repurpose this covenant stuff to, to make Bitcoin NG. Um, but it's worth a read if you're, if you're interested in vaults. So anyway, they, they sort of discussed in the abstract this idea of how you could put a constraint on not only just unlocking a coin and spending it to some arbitrary destination, but you could put constraints on how the coins actually spent. And then you could use that to re reify this idea of a vault. Um, gotcha. So, so let's just take one step one, just to make sure everyone's following along, right? Cause I think I'm following you and I think you, obviously you understand this, but just make sure listeners are following along. Let me put it this way, or you correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but the basic idea is when you have a, like probably probably people are used to this idea of sending Bitcoin from one address to another, but really what's going on kind of under the hood is that address is it can contain a script and in all, and you can think of it like we're locking coins into a certain script and we need certain conditions to unlock that coin and spend it somewhere else. And so what we're talking about here is like using script in a special way to create this special vault construction that gives us maybe a little bit more confidence about if something were to happen that I could then uh, stop the theft of my coins, let's say, by pulling them into a different recovery address, let's say. Is that high level what we're talking about? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, just to restate, you know, when you're sending your coins somewhere, quote unquote, um, what you're really doing is you're spending a coin, which involves presenting um, a, a proof or an input to basically a little computer program that had locked the coins. Um, and that input gets fed into that computer program. The Bitcoin script engine executes that program with the inputs. Um, the inputs are now called witnesses. Um, uh, and then if that execution succeeds, then you can basically lock the value up with another computer program. Um, and in Bitcoin today, right now, um, if you successfully unlock that first computer program, uh, you can pretty much spend the coins in whatever way that you want. Um, but this idea of covenants is that, okay, maybe you're presenting a proof. Well, you're definitely presenting a proof to unlock the coins in the first place, but 
you might then put them under a certain kind of computer program, a certain kind of locking script that um, looks at something beyond just a signature to unlock. Maybe it looks at the structure of the transaction that you're spending it into. And so this is a very general, very powerful um, idea. <clears throat> and for a long time, I mean, maybe we can talk about this later. A long time, people were very worried about that idea enabling something like um, government, you know, uh, control of, of coins. But um, that actually turns out not to be uh, any, any kind of a concern, really. Um, but basically, you can use this really powerful, you know, new ability to do something like vaults, which just just in exactly what you said <clears throat> is this idea. If someone, let's say, someone gets a hold of like the key that you use to do this unvaulting process, right? Um, they start to try to move the coins, but because you've locked the coins into a vault with a delay period. Um, they have to wait, say, a day or a week or, or maybe even a month um, to move the coins. And then in the meantime, you have some very trivial, you know, system or program that's monitoring the chain and sees, oh, wow, I just saw an attempted spend on your vault. Did you expect that? And if you didn't expect that, you can jump in and immediately sweep those funds into a recovery path. Um, and so the idea is that, I mean, this if you get the tooling right, like this makes Bitcoin theft exceptionally difficult because what it allows you to do, um, and let me know if I'm jumping the gun here, but yeah, sure, um, it, it allows you to, to generate this the keys to this recovery path in a completely different way um, and perhaps a very sort of impractical or operationally difficult way than your sort of everyday keys, right? So. You could do a completely offline key generation. Like uh, you could generate the keys in such a way that they would be almost like useless for use in a multi-sig quorum, which is what people do now to secure their coins. They have, you know, maybe a, a multi-sig quorum with um, a few different kinds of keys or devices. And that's great. But um, if you're talking about like super, super, super cold storage, um, you know, you, you just kind of can't use that in a in every day in a, in a multi-sig form to spend coins. So, but with vaults, your recovery path could be that like ultra cold path. Um, and so I, I think, you know, between that and sort of the, um, the ability to intervene if someone does capture your, you know, unvault keys, which, which definitely could be multi-sig or could be really any kind of, uh, uh Bitcoin, uh, key arrangement. Um, you know that it's a, it's a very powerful combination. Gotcha. Yeah. And so, can you just explain for listeners what is who are the typical users here? Like, are we thinking of like big institutions? Are we thinking of, um, let's say, a, a, a family office with a lot of coins, or are we talking even like DIY hodler, average stacker guy is going to use this kind of setup, or is it even like? to the level that you might have like a mobile phone uh, Bitcoin wallet with a vault kind of setup. Could you just explain who do you see as the primary users here? Sure, yeah. So um, when I started thinking about this stuff, I was really kind of a moron personally with my own coins. I had, you know, a single sig with a, a, a passphrase, um, basically. That's a reasonable to, setup, yeah. To, to dox myself. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty low tech, right? Um, but I, I was, like I said, I was sort of in an industrial custody context, or, or at least was exposed to one. Um, and I was really, really trying to think about how to de-risk those operations. And, um, uh, you know, vaults were known at the time, but the problem was with the existing vaulting strategies um, were that, like, they're just operationally extremely difficult. And we can talk about that um, in a little bit. But um, what I really love about this proposal is that, it kind of hits the full spectrum. Um, I think, you know, everybody from kind of the biggest custody operations to, you know, individual hodlers um, uh, have the, uh, you know, it, it's very easy to use this new construct uh, op vault. Like the, the, the user interface, if you will, is like very, very simple, um, but flexible enough to sort of accommodate um, any use case. And that's that's in large part due to, you know, the, the power of covenants. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, um, 
your paper also mentioned, so talking about covenants as well, your paper mentions two kinds, so it'd be cool if you could explain that. So we have the pre-computed and general. So could you just explain what, what are those? Yeah, sure. So um, again, the idea of a covenant is that you are encumbering coins, not just on you know the initial unlocking script, but um, you're actually encumbering them on the basis of the the transaction that the coins are going into. And so what that means is you have two options here. You could either do something where you basically pre-compute like a tree, all possible paths of, you know, how these coins can flow through this, this vault thing over the, the lifetime of, you know, some number of transactions, or you could encode um, a more general program almost in the script that is not bounded to a particular number of transactions. Um, and the second is significantly more powerful, obviously, because you could, for example, have a vault where, you know, you can, um, you know, partially unvault as many times as you want, revault and so forth. Um, but the difficulty there is that um, up until now, all of the techniques for doing this this general covenant thing um, uh, were sort of uh, complicated and scary. And well, maybe the, the techniques themselves were not complicated, but they resulted in these scripts that were um, really, really complicated. Uh, uh, so an end user to use one of these general covenant techniques would have to write like a very, very long um, or relatively long uh, and complicated Bitcoin script. I mean, it's like, if, if people out there are familiar with like the difference between assembly language and, you know, say Python, um, you yeah. know, if, if you're, if you're writing Bitcoin script to do something like what op vault does, you're essentially writing like assembly language versus, you know, calling some Python function. Um, but, um, these, these pre-computed vaults are still very useful. And I think, um, Specifically, in the case of like um, a proposal called Check Template Verify that, that yeah. Jeremy Rubin and others um, have worked on, um, that's that's still a very useful construct for a variety of things. And the idea there again is you're sort of saying, okay, I'm going to lock up these coins into a predetermined flow of transactions, but I know that at some point that flow of transactions will will terminate, and I'll just kind of get regular coins out. Um, but the problem with that is, uh, is that, you know, you've got to pre-anticipate all the different ways that you want to spend. And so if you're talking about, um, you know, vaults, uh, that, that introduces certain limitations. Yeah, gotcha. And your paper also calls out this idea that, as an example, there's this issue similarly with Lightning of understanding what's the fee rate now when we start the vault. And then let's say in five years time, when we unvault, the fee rates could be totally different. And I understand in Lightning, they have this concept of an anchor output. And I know uh, from the paper, you also mentioned a similar kind of idea of um, anchor, sorry, what was the terminology? Ephemeral oh, anchors. Yes, ephemeral anchors. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about how um, the the goals, I guess, are like what, what is a good vault uh, proposal going to look like? Yeah, so... Um... I think there are certain features that a vault should have. So I, I guess maybe by way of comparison, um, do you think it's worth talking through how, uh, you know, sort of the most basic vault implementation with pre-signed transactions work and kind yeah, of, sure. let's, you yeah, know, let's talk about that and then kind of look at what's, what's the difference with op vault. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think it's hard in the abstract, if I start describing, you know, features of, of vaults, you know, they're kind of like, uh, abstract. And so I don't, I don't think they make sense until you kind of see the alternative. Um, but right now, if you want to do one of these vaults with Bitcoin, um, what you would do is you would generate this like one time key, uh, that you intend on throwing away. Um, and you would send your coins into some transactions, uh, that are controlled by this one time key. And then you would use that key to sign a few, sort of pre-formulated transactions that, that essentially lock the spend paths into these transactions that you've generated. Does that make sense? Yep. 
Gotcha. So it's kind of like very, um, it's a very critical setup step. And then you also want to make sure that key never gets compromised because yeah, you know, yeah, you're exactly. done if that key um, gets compromised. Yeah. And, you know, as a, as a user, if you do this setup ceremony, like you better hope that the key was actually deleted because then someone has the ability to spend these funds that you think you vaulted, but, um, you, you know, you actually didn't. Um, and in fact, key deletion, like is notoriously sort of impossible to prove. And this is especially a concern in an industrial context where, you know, you might have to prove to auditors that you're, um, that you're doing everything right. So, so for both individuals and, and companies, it's, it's pretty tough. Um, so the, the setup ceremony is, can be fairly onerous for something like this. And then along the lines of what you were mentioning a few minutes ago about fees, you know, because you're pre generating these transactions, you're locking yourself into some set of fee rates. You're locking yourself into uh, the set of destinations that the funds can be involved to. And, you know, um, that might mean that you have to use some kind of intermediate hot ish wallet to actually route the funds after you've unvaulted them. Um, and so, um, you know, there's still value perhaps in doing this kind of a setup because again, it, it gives you that delay period where you can contest, you know, a hacker trying to spend your coins, but, but there are all these operational considerations and, um, you know, it makes it, you have to think about a whole lot upfront, do everything right operationally, and then kind of hope that you've chosen the right, you know, say fee rates to pre-generate. Um, so if you, if we think about, and, and this is really how the development of this started out for me was, um, sitting down, I, I didn't intend on writing a software proposal, to be honest with you. I, I almost wanted to come up with a, a thought experiment about what the perfect vault would be. Um, and so for one, I think for the perfect vault, um, you can have multiple deposits to the same vault, uh, with, with this pre-signed approach, you basically create the vault that you're going to create. And then that amount is sort of fixed until gotcha. you withdraw. It's like a one-time deposit rather than multiple deposits, let's say. Yeah, exactly. Um, whereas I thought, you know, you should be able to choose these vault parameters and then just kind of deposit so that, for example, if, if you're, if you want to DCA on an exchange, say every day, um, and you want to have that withdrawal go immediately into your vault, you should be able to do that without any kind of operational headache. Um, so that's one. Um, another is this idea of having a dynamic vault target, or I'm sorry, a dynamic unvault target. And what that means is when you want to go to withdrawal from your vault, instead of having to lock in some fixed intermediate wallet that you're withdrawing to, and, you know, hoping that that doesn't get compromised, um, because, uh, you know, if, if that does, then you've got to sweep to your recovery path, which is probably a big pain to actually go and access. Um, if you could actually just pick where you wanted to withdraw to, um, and then start the unvault process with those parameters. So this, um, dynamic unvault tar uh, target allows you to do that. Then the other thing, um, that you want, that's, that's probably just nice to have, but, um, this idea of doing partial unvaults where you're not moving the entire balance of everything that's vaulted at once. You're just kind of peeling off some amount um, to unvault at a time. Gotcha, right? So you could have like a big saving amount and okay, the Bitcoin has gone up so much, I'm going to peel a small amount off and buy a house for the family, but keep the rest in the vault. That kind of setup, exactly, that yeah. kind of use case, let's say. Yeah, exactly. And then the final thing that you want, um, which is kind of an implication of the dynamic targets, um, is this idea of batching. Um, batching is, is really, really important because if you're generating all these vault outputs, um, then you don't want to have to, you know, generate unvault outputs for every single vault that you, um, that you create, because otherwise let's say that an attacker gets hold of your hot wallet keys or your unvault keys. Um, then, you know, they might start to withdraw, um, you know, could be thousands and thousands of vaults depending, depending on your scale of custody. Uh, and so in a case like that, you want to be able to sweep to the recovery path, um, as efficiently as you possibly can in batch. Um, and so that's one of the big innovations of op vault is that, um, it's the only proposal to date that actually enables 
That's gotcha. right. So to be clear, in this case, this is more useful for, let's say, a professional large-scale custodian who is perhaps managing thousands of vaults and maybe not as useful for, let's say, the individual hodler just doing one vault for himself, right? Is that am well, I understanding well, right there? That's an interesting question because if you want to allow people to, let's say, with you know, deposit to these vaults on a daily basis, the only way that you can actually have multiple deposits like that work is with separate UTXOs. And yes. so at the end of the day, um, you know, you've got to spend those UTXOs. And if you don't have batching, then that becomes an, a very inefficient process with a vault. Uh, so naively, yeah, it does, it does look like this is, you know, only a big deal for big custodians, but it's really not. It's, it's a big deal for any user of vault, I think. Um, and so th this idea of batching, I think without it, it's very hard to make vaults a practical thing. Gotcha. And just out of curiosity, even today, there are limits on how many UTXOs you can have in one transaction, right? I don't know the exact number. Someone correct me, but it might be like 100 or maybe more, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. So let's say this stacker has been stacking, you know, once a day for years. He might have like 800 outputs or something, right? And so even that would have to be, um, let's say, broken down into chunks that are actually doable. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're still sort of hitting the same problem. You know, if you've got, uh, let's say you're doing your daily DCA. True, true. Yes. To be fair to you, that's, that's a problem already today. So, you know, yeah. you could be really screwing yourself over if you're not careful about how you manage your coins today. So we're not going to like ding you for that or anything. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, that, that makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about the relation of this with some of the other ideas that people have been talking about. So, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and I've, I've got an episode with uh, Jeremy Rubin talking about CTV, uh, probably a year or two ago now. Um, and there, at the same time that the CTV drama happened, I think there was also there were other proposals, right? I think Rusty from Blockstream had another idea. I think it was OptX Hash, and then some mm -hmm. other people were talking about a combination of I think it was Chexig from Stack and Cat, um, mm -hmm. which could do something as well. So could you just talk a little bit about the relation with Vault? Op vault as opposed mm -hmm. to some of the other ideas? Sure, yeah. So um, I think a lot of people have realized that bringing covenants into Bitcoin somehow is a really, really, really good idea. Um, perhaps even essential if you think about the need for things like um, coin pools um, to actually scale at UTX ownership. Certainly vaults, I think, is, is increasingly seeming to me to be an essential thing for, for custody. Um, uh, but yeah, this problem of how to actually bring covenants into Bitcoin in the right way uh, is very, very thorny because not only do you have the option of doing, say, pre-computed covenants, which are sort of simpler um, versus these general covenants, but then even within those two categories, you've got a whole number of different options for, for actually implementing this stuff. And so the design space there is wide open um, and there are a lot of different proposals, each of which has certain limitations and certain advantages. Um, you know, check template verify, for example, uh, is, is very, very simple and I've reviewed it in depth. And I, I think it's a, a safe change for Bitcoin, but it does have certain limitations mostly in that you have to actually, you know, pre-compute this, uh, graph of transactions. So anyway. To step back, like solving the general covenants problem is kind of like a holy grail at this point, and it's really, really difficult. Um, vaults, in particular, are just a use case of covenants. They're kind of like um, a subset of the, the covenant functionality. And so um, one of my ideas here was instead of trying to solve the general covenants problem, which a bunch of people have done and is kind of a quagmire at this point, I figured I just want to do as good a job as I can on vaults. And, you know, maybe that requires some covenant like behavior, which, which it turns out it does. I see. So maybe it can be interpreted as you're trying to thread the needle here in terms of trying to solve this grand, grand problem of trying to do the whole covenant shebang, uh, but trying to give people the specific thing that's needed for people to be able to vault and unvault their coins. Is that, a fair summary, you would say? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Exactly. Okay. And so I, I, I spent, um, you know, I was excited when I finally understood Check Template Verify and, um, you know, worked with Jeremy a bit. 
um, and actually developed a prototype of implementing vaults within CTV. Um, and the advantage that you get there is that you don't have to, to you do this really um, precarious ephemeral key thing where you generate the one-time key and then throw it away. Um, CTV just kind of enforces the, the, the covenant on chain, um, which is great, but you still have the problem of dealing with fees because with CTV, because you're pre-computing the exact, uh, you know, flow of transactions and then committing to it in a hash, kind of like Merkle trees, if people are familiar with that, um, you have to pre-specify, you know, the withdrawal paths, the recovery paths, the, um, well, I guess you have to specify the recovery paths in any case, but, um, the, uh, the fee rates. Um, and so it's like, it's an improvement for sure over the pre-signed transaction implementation of vaults, but it still left me kind of wanting in terms of uh, functionality. I see. So, yeah, so basically you see it like vaults offers a different functionality to what CTV was, It's, but it's not the full covenant thing. So Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Go on. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just um, going to say that uh, CTV, CTV is much more general than Op Vault, but Op Vault has some behavior in there that CTV can't do. So it's it's not like one is a subset of the other. If that gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, totally fair. Um, and so, could you tell us a little bit about just the life cycle of this process? Then, so like, let's say we had Op Vault. What does it look like to start a vault? You know, transact. Uh, or even do, let's say, a partial unvaulting, and then at the end you're closing down the vault because you're passing it on or inheritance scenario or something like that. If you could just talk mm -hmm. through a life, life cycle there. Sure, yeah. So when you're creating a vault, um, all that means is that you're um, unlocking some coins that you have control of or getting someone to send you some coins um, to what's called a script pub key. And the script pub, pub key is, is basically the name for that um, puzzle that you have to solve whenever you spend a coin. Um, and the contents of that script pub key contain um, an op code, op vault, say, um, that has uh, three parameters. Um, the first parameter locks you into a certain recovery path. So that determines you know, what your super cold key is going to be. The second parameter is the spend delay, which is just a number. It's it works exactly in the way that um, check lock time verify and check. I'm sorry, check sequence verify works um, in that you can specify a relative delay um, in terms of either time or blocks. And then the third parameter that you give it is um, uh, the unvault key, and so that's basically. Like what, what's the mechanism that I'm going to use to authorize the start of the unvault process? Um, so once you have that script, you can just, you know, send UTXOs uh, to be encumbered by that script kind of as much as you want. Um, and at any time you can sweep those vaults into the recovery path uh, with no delay whatsoever. Um, gotcha. Yeah. But if so you it's want, kind of like oh, a, sorry. it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a watchtower. You sort of need some kind of watchtower-like feature, kind of like Lightning, mm -hmm. this idea of a watchtower that you're watching mm -hmm. to see, oh, is somebody spending my coin? Oh, quick, I need to use my recovery key to kind of, you know, but, but I know I'm safe as long as I have the watchtower that detects it within a certain time period, right? Depending on how many blocks we set that, that time lock, right? Um, and so then, as I understand, then the idea is, you know, let's say I put some coins into my vault, I see, oh, look, someone's stealing from me. Okay, let me co recover those coins into my recovery pathway uh, because that other hack, the hacker guy, is he's encumbered by the time lock, but I am not. I can just pull it straight out to my recovery exactly. key. Is that the scenario? Exactly. That's the setup. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so, so, yeah, when you, if you want to start the unvault process, then you send some amount of the vault into the script, you know, that's, that's op unvault with the exact same parameters, except instead of specifying the unvault key, you're specifying the target hash, which basically locks you into what, what is, where is this withdrawal proposing to go? Um, and just as you said, what you want when you're using vaults is some kind of a watchtower. Um, and what's nice about 
the watchtower for vaults is that it's it's exceptionally simple, um, and you can do it in a variety of ways under a different you know a variety of trust models. So, for example, let's say that I don't want to run this this watchtower myself, but maybe I'm comfortable with like the watchtower company knowing which outputs um, you know I have. You can tell them what the outputs are to watch, and then they can alert you if those start to move, and then you can make the judgment call whether to intervene or not. Yeah. Or maybe I want to give them, you know, my recovery pathway, and then they can just scan, you know, for any any movements associated with that recovery pathway, and then I can give them the recovery transactions, and then they can broadcast. That's a that's putting a bit yeah. more trust in the watchtower. Yeah. Or maybe I don't trust the watchtower at all, and I can give them some kind of probabilistic data structure that might tell me if my coins are moved or, you know, maybe like kind of like a bloom filter, they might give me some false positives for whether the coins are moving, but the watchtower can sit there and then I can, you know, get an alert from them about maybe, maybe your coins are moving and then um, jump in and check myself. So the point being um, that there are a variety of ways to, to run these watchtowers and they're, they're very, very simple things. Yeah. And so one other question with the, recovery pathway so is it the case that let's say you are a big custodian and you are managing thousands of vaults for thousands of customers when you have to do the recovery or to kind of you see that there's a hack does that mean you would need to now pull all all of them at once or can you individually you get what i'm asking yeah absolutely so um it depends on whether the vaults share a recovery path um, and okay. in practice, I think what you would do typically is you would say, okay, I have my ultra cold, um, key. I'm going to take the XPUB of that key and then just generate different recovery paths as needed so that they're all locked by the same, you know, super cold key, but you're, you're getting different recovery paths so that, um, because exactly as you're saying, what happens is when you sweep one vault with a given recovery key, uh, because there's no additional authentication or authorization required to actually do that sweep, um, anybody might be able to come along and just kind of replay that sweep against vaults that share that recovery path. Now, um, one proposed change that I'm kind of noodling on after putting the initial release of this out there, getting some feedback from the other devs, is one option is you could actually um, give some flexibility around how the recovery path works. So right now I just say, okay, if, if, if the coins are headed into the recovery path, just val you know, it's valid, let's do it. Um, another option would be you could do that, or you could decide to say, you know what, actually this recovery path is protected by another key that I have to sign with. And so you don't have that replayability problem. Um, so that, that option would introduce a little bit of, um, flexibility, but then, you know, it makes it a little bit more complicated to decide for a vault user what, what they should do. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with the unvault process, like the normal unvault process, that still allows you to specify a different address, let's say like a new mm -hmm. address to receive the vaulted coins out into um, but it's just the recovery path has like specified uh, pathways, does it? Yeah, exactly. Um, and the idea there is that, you know, when you set up the vault, you want to say, this is the only way to recover these coins, um, because that's a special ability to be able to sweep all of the value into, into one path. So yeah, the recovery path is, is, is pre-specified and completely static, but the recovery path could be like, say, a taproot script where you have a whole, you know, you could do something where you say, okay, my recovery path is that um, within six months, I can spend it, uh, or I can spend it immediately with my super, super cold keys, or after six months, um, you know, I can spend it with this like backup set of keys. So you, you can do anything that Taproot allows you to do with the recovery path, which is, you know, a, a huge range of flexibility. I see. Yeah, right. So because of that taproot ID with like the public key spend or the script path spend, you can set up a different, you can set up different scenarios. And, you know, people are talking about this idea of having, let's say, like a degrading setup, right? Like that after a certain amount of time that only two out of the whatever five keys or whatever um, keys could spend. Um, one other question I had as well is 
There's this idea in your paper. It's saying uh, being able to sweep to the recovery key at any point with no witness data. Does this just push the problem back one step? Like, could the criminal or the hacker just try to find out the recovery key or like hack that part? Is that just pushing the problem back one step? It. Um, I, I would push back a little bit because, um, so they have to figure out two things. Well, I mean, if they compromise your sort of backup recovery key, uh, then yeah, totally. I mean that, you know, they can generate the data necessary to sweep all the vaults and, and everything. I think the idea here is that, um, we all know, at least in theory, how to generate a really, really, really cold key. It's just that oftentimes we don't do that because it's, it's very inconvenient and, you know, basically inaccessible. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, if someone finds your, just in the same way that if, if, if someone right now kind of discovers your, um, uh, your, 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 uh, your keys, you know, your host, um, the idea here is that this just allows you to kind of like segment that process from sort of the everyday operation of, spending coins. Um, and it gives you some granularity in, in security, if that makes sense. Yeah. But but so please push me on that if it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I'm getting you there. So I think the way I'm seeing it then is it's sort of like you could have this separate setup with much harder to access keys than what you're, you're, you are normally using. But, but I guess today today nowadays, let's say if, you, if, you, if you're like a serious hodler with lots of coins or maybe you're a company, you might have today a hot wallet with a small portion of your coins and a cold wallet with like some, you know, big, big multi-sig or just keys distributed and all this kind of complicated stuff. So I guess that's kind of what people are doing today. But in fairness, not everybody can use multi-sig today. Now, of course, there's my sponsor, Unchained Capital, and there's, you know, there's Spectre and Sparrow and all this stuff out there. But I think in practice, and I, and I think that's where your proposal is getting at, is like this idea that it could give the benefits of multi-sig for people who currently do not have the either technical means or the comfort to use multi-sig today. And I, that's where I'm seeing it at least. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, I mean, um, you know, in an industrial context, uh, like multi-sig can be very troublesome getting together, you know, enough of a signing quorum, you know, that means managing, you know, a, a diversity of teams and devices and, uh, it's just, it's really a lot of kind of like amortized overhead for the operation of, of coins. Whereas with this, you know, you can have, um, you can have sort of a, a streamlined setup for spending. And then if something goes wrong with that setup, you can just fall back to like a really, really, um, secure system, but, but kind of, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, you can have something that's, that's really secure, you know, whether that's kind of a lighter multi-sig or, some kind of, um, you know, uh, mere secret sharing or MPC thing. Um, but it's just easier to use than like, like having a single multi-sig configuration that's both extremely robust, um, but also kind of permits spending. So it makes sense to me that you want to segment kind of the security model a little bit for those two. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you also explain the reliance on package relay? Because that's something also mentioned in, in your paper. So um, just pack, uh, if you could just give like the super high level of what package relay is and then explain the reliance there. Yeah, sure. So package relay is the pretty simple idea that um, if you have a number of unconfirmed transactions that depend on one another, you should be able to relay those to the peer-to-peer -peer network and they should be able to travel together and have a kind of aggregate fee rate that allows nodes to say, okay, well, this parent transaction has a really crappy fee rate, but the child transaction pays a ton. So it together, if I mine them together, I actually get a very attractive fee rate. Um, and this is important because like pretty much any second layer contract application for Bitcoin involves sort of pre-specifying a fee rate at least you know so in in lightning for example what they do is um you know the commitment transaction has some fee rate itself but then to support dynamic fee adjustment during settlement time there's an output that anybody can spend that they call the anchor output um and um this allows you to do child pays for parent um but things kind of get into trouble 
if you don't have package relay, because maybe the parent is so low fee that um, it can't even broadcast to land in the mempool to get bumped by the child. So anyway, um, package relay is very, very important and pretty much everybody wants it. Uh, Gloria and others are, are working on um, a, a proposal there and it's looking like it's gonna come along pretty shortly, but the long, long and the short of it is that package relay just allows us to do dynamic fee adjustment in a way that um, you know, lets us kind of not, not worry about, um, potentially getting, uh, uh, typhooned by, uh, the mempool fees. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for any listeners interested, I have an episode with Gloria talking about, uh, package relay, of course. Um, and one other question I've got is, uh, there's a bit more chatter about Miniscript right now. So I'm curious, does Miniscript play into this at all? Does it help? Does it not help? You know, I, I'd say it's sort of unrelated. Like if Obvault wound up making it in, um, there would be a mini script, uh, I don't know what they call them, function for, for OpVault and op UnVault. But what's nice about OpVault is that like the opcodes are very, very simple and this, the resulting scripts are very, very simple. So t typically mini script is a big benefit if you've got, you know, some kind of relatively complicated, I mean, using multi-sig and Bitcoin script is, is cumbersome to say the least. And so uh, something like mini script, uh, there, if you're, you know, if you're composing things with time locks and, and multi-sigs and making very complicated scripts, mini scripts is a huge win. I think it'd still be great, you know, for OutVault, but it's the mini script and the Bitcoin script for OutVault look very, very similar. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm with you. So it's like, it's, it helps, but it's not a huge win. Okay. Um, and then, uh, actually, one other question I had was around one of the, I guess, critiques, let's say, of the general covenant schemes, because I think in your paper, you also mention that uh, that it wouldn't be suitable because it would result in very bloated script pub keys. So could you just explain that a bit? Yeah. Uh, so again, you know, general covenants give you this very low level machinery to essentially write, you know, computer programs in script that determine the spend path of the, the coins. And um, because you're articulating uh, something like a vault in Bitcoin script um, to get to get the equivalent functionality of what something like op vault provides you. Um, you have to write like really long, really complicated script. And um, a lot of people have proposed these general covenant mechanisms, but I haven't seen a lot of actual end uses of them because I think the resulting scripts are just so gnarly that they make the proposals kind of unattractive, um, at least for me personally. And then the other problem is, you know, let's say that you have one of these general covenant mechanisms and someone devises, you know, they, they go to the time and write this giant script that does everything that you want um, and everybody's, you know, wants to use it. Well, now you've got everybody kind of doing the same thing, but they're bloating the chain space with the same exact script, you know, that's really, that's really big. Um, so I think kind of the bull case for general covenant stuff is that it allows end user experimentation. Um, and you don't have to, you know, get a soft fork done if you want some new big piece of script functionality. But I think in actuality, if, if you had something like that and some exciting use comes along, that's relatively complicated, you'd really have to soft fork it in at some point because the waste, uh, would just be so much, um, in terms of the witness sizes. Gotcha. Okay. And so one other question, is there anything specifically enabled by Taproot here or not? Um, not really. This could uh, have as easily been done with um, bear script or uh, pay to witness script hash. And indeed um, the way that it's written right now is it's kind of compatible with anything. It's not Taproot only. Um, so, I mean, yeah. Taproot certainly, uh, helps, but, um, it's, it's not, uh, I wouldn't say the two are directly related. Yeah, sure. I saw, um, from the mailing list, there was some interesting discussion. I think Greg Sanders had this suggestion and you were commenting that this could, um, allow all the ta the outputs to be paid to Taproot. So that could be maybe some small part privacy benefit there. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm trying to think through that one because so originally when I wrote this, you could do the op vault output any way you wanted. So taproot or, or uh, uh, 
SegWit version zero. Um, but then when you went to spend it into the op unvault output to sort of trigger the start of the withdrawal process, that had to be a bare script because, you know, when the script interpreter is looking at that op unvault output, it's saying, okay, is this compatible with the op vault it's spending? And um, mostly due to my own inexperience, I, I was just like, okay, well, it needs to be bare so that we can read it directly. But um, when, I, when I put the design out there in the code, Greg Sanders came back and said, hey, if you just stick this extra little bit of information in the witness when you're spending the op vault, you can actually support um, doing the op unvault in any kind of address type um, and uh, or any kind of script hashed address type. So, um, so that was a big improvement. I actually implemented that and pushed the code uh, last night. And I, I think that's um, it's a big upgrade. Okay, fantastic. And um, any other feedback you've received uh, on the proposal so far? No, it's, it's all been pretty positive. Um, I think people were just kind of hungry to see like a more narrow proposal, a more specific application of some of this covenant stuff. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy that I released the paper and an implementation at the same time, because I think a lot of people have been proposing ideas on the mailing list and, you know, it's, it's one thing to write an email, but it's another thing to actually like code it up with some tests and, and see it working. Um, so, so feedback has been good. Um, I mean, I think the next step is probably to write a BIP. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty mellow in terms of activation. I mean, I, look, I think, um, I'm sorry, drop my headphones there. Um, <laughs> I, I think, uh, I think it'd be a huge benefit to have this in Bitcoin. I, I would use it personally. I know, you know, um, a lot of industrial users would use it personally. I think it makes custody a lot safer uh, for anybody. Um, but I'm not really, you know, my expectations about where it's going are very tempered because you just <laughs> can't have expectations about that kind of thing, uh, gotcha. especially yeah. after watching what happened with Jeremy and uh, CTV. Right. right. Uh, I think uh, it, it's probably a case where maybe the community hadn't been let's say brought on board with it and maybe that was i don't know i'm i'm speculating right I'm, I, it seems that's that's what it seems like to me um but that said i mean if it helps hodlers hodl in this case you know i think that there could be uh there could be a case there like people could see oh you know what this actually could be useful this could be handy for people um so let's see what happens there hey <laughs> yeah right right um i I know, yeah, with, with, with Jeremy and CTV, you know, it's it took me a long time to actually appreciate what CTV does because when you first see it, I just think Jeremy's clock speed is like 3x of what everybody else's is. And, you know, like we, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I, I think Jeremy's brilliant. Um, but when I first came across CTV, I was like, what, you know, what the hell, what do I want this for? Um, and it took me a while to actually internalize what some of the uses there are. I, I think Opvault is... A little bit easier to approach because the again the use case is just so clear cut and you know keeping coins safe is kind of everybody's concern in Bitcoin and so it, it makes it a little bit easier to evaluate kind of whether or not op vaults the the right thing ultimately. Yeah, yeah, I think um, it it certainly seems more crafted with this particular use case in mind. Whereas I think if a proposal comes and it and it's like extremely general and very conceptual, you kind of have to be really deep into the technicals or really, really into it to go spend the time learning about it and then pushing for it. Because, uh, yeah, for this kind of thing, I think people, it just seems like the bar has risen a lot for what would need, what it would require. Whereas if you went back years and years ago, people, they, they used to do self forks pretty regularly. Um, but, uh, well, I guess, yeah, let me just see if there's anything else. I'm just thinking. You know, actually, on that yeah. note, I mean, I, I'd just like to comment a little bit. Um, you said something sure. interesting just now, which is, you know, we used to do soft forks more regularly. And, you know, obviously, like Bitcoin was more nascent and smaller back in the day. But, I mean, people people forget, like, we act, we activated, you know, Check sequence verify, check lock time verify, BIP sixty eight, all, all within the same year, and that was pretty close to SegWit. Um, and so I, I think you know, 
more than anybody, trust me, I, I get that there are certain things about Bitcoin that we don't want to change. I get that, like, this is the base layer and you you want to be very risk averse, but Bitcoin definitely isn't isn't finished. Um, and um, I, that's an easy kind of tagline to use on, on Twitter. But um, there are certain aspects of Bitcoin that, that um, I, I think really do need to change um, to facilitate the use that we're, they're all kind of hoping for. Um, and so I think I hope we can be less skittish about evaluating proposals kind of from pr first principles, you know, uh, determining like whether they're safe um, and then, you know, looking at, at proceeding because, um, you know, as things stand, I, I do worry about um, Bitcoin stagnating a little bit. And I think it's fair to point out as well that like you have to also consider what's the harm, right? Like, so it, let's say we do op vault. The only people being harmed potentially are the people who choose to use op vault, correct? Right? It's not that op vault has some kind of massive uh, negative externality on all the other hodlers and users of Bitcoin, right? That's right. I mean, you have to be diligent about. Um, yeah. So the one the one exception to that would be if you could construct a pathological use of op vault that say makes validation very difficult. And so, you know, you have to have a, a period for a few months where people are just sitting there trying to construct these pathological uses that can break. You know, I, I sat there doing that with CTV for a while and I was like, well, this, this thing kind of, I can't figure out how to break it. And it's been months and a lot of people who aren't favorable to it can't figure out how to break it. So, you know, it looks safe to me. Um, and everything needs to go through that process because um, conceptually, you're exactly right. You know, if you introduce a feature, maybe only the people using that feature are harmed. But from an implementation standpoint, um, it could be that there's a, sort of uh, contagion uh, in terms of validation. I see. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, at the end of the day, I think I think that was probably one other critique that people were, I mean, just rewinding back to what happened with CTV. I think people were complaining that there was not any, let's say, commercial use cases of CTV, or at least that was one of the critic, critical lines. I'm not sure if that maybe you disagree with that. Maybe there were. Um, but it seems with the idea of the vault, it seems a bit more very clear and very obvious. There are companies built around this whole idea of securing people's coins or helping them secure their coins. It seems like there is a bit more of a commercial use here. And so therefore, we might see more interest in this idea. At least that's my speculation. Yeah, I think it's 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 a more tangible thing that more people can immediately go, oh yeah, I, I might have a use for that. Um, or that'll benefit me somehow. I think with CTV, the irony is I think there were there are a ton of use cases that might be really valuable, like um, the DLC efficiency improvements, um, this idea of um, being able to initiate and receive lightning while you're while you're completely offline. Um, or while your signing keys are offline. Um, and then, you know, to an extent, um, the, the, the vaults there could be helpful. Um, but I, I think it was just tough when you think about trying to understand and appreciate CTV because you were kind of blasted with all these like possible use cases. But, you know, I, I think nobody, you know, a given use case wasn't maybe fleshed out or championed enough. Um, uh, for it to, to kind of go through. And it, so it's all understandable. I mean, I, I think um, kind of from everybody's perspective in the CTV case, it's understandable. I, you know, I have all kinds of concerns about the Bitcoin development process and, and in, in, in no case, you know, is it like, oh, somebody's doing a bad job here. It's just kind of the nature of trying to do something as decentralized and as kind of structurelessness um, uh, as, as this whole process is. Right, and I think that was perhaps, uh, I don't know, it's hard for me to, I'm not trying to put words in Jeremy's mouth, but it seemed that he was perhaps unclear about what bar he had to meet to sort of get this over the line, maybe in his mind. And other people were saying, no, we just don't want to change it, don't change anything, like just leave it as it is. Um, and so maybe that's always going to be a, a debate and an argument going um, when anyone wants to do any, literally anything with Bitcoin. Um, but perhaps... It's about uh, if you if you get enough people on your side in terms of uh, let's say if Bitcoin the, the community whatever you want to call it, is this anarchic mob of users, developers, miners, and companies, 
and you you sort of have to win enough of them over with this idea and say, look, there's so much value here. We're going to you know make vaults easier, and that's going to make custody easier, and that may make people more comfortable to use Bitcoin, which obviously is going to grow our network and grow the users um, and bring more people in. Maybe that's the argument. Maybe that's the case you've got to make. Yeah, yeah, that that could be. And I, I think we're in a, in a little bit of a tough spot because, you know, for the last major soft forks, um, there have been really a small set of people, extremely capable people who, you know, have proposed them and, and um, have, have written the code. And now some of those people have kind of stepped back a little bit because they realize, or I'm speculating that maybe they realize that kind of having a dependence on, you know, the same group of people making changes is, is, is not a healthy state um, for Bitcoin to be in. And so, you know, as a result, th this process of making consensus changes is in a little bit of a, a, a no man's land where there's kind of a vacuum in terms of like, OK, well, who do we who, who's kind of the, the authoritative voice here? And of course, there shouldn't be an authoritative voice. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, you do like you're saying, you do have to go out and get kind of this critical mass of community support. And that's a tough game because, you know, uh, where do you cut the line on that? So, um, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's really, uh, it's, it's fascinating and, and, uh, and, and very difficult. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, I guess that's the question or the final, uh, closing thought where to, where to from here with op vault. For me, I, I think, you know, I've got a lot of irons in the fire with different projects I'm working on. And so, um, I'm going to probably write up a bit, and then propose that. And then I think I'll get the implementation to a point where I feel pretty comfortable with it. Um, I'm sure I'll need, you know, a lot of help from uh, some of the gray beards in, in terms of making sure the script interpreter changes are, are really kind of uh, ironclad. But um, once I get the code into a shape I'm happy with and I get a bit written, I, I'll just let it sit there, I guess. And if people like it, you know, we can move forward, whatever that means. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to go back to my other projects uh, and, uh, and let it hang out as an idea. Fantastic. Well, uh, listeners, I'll put the links in the show notes. James's website is jamesobe slash vault.pdf is where you can go to read it. Um, and there's a mailing list post and a Twitter thread. I'll, I'll put all the links in the show notes. James, thank you for joining me today. Hey, man, it's always a pleasure.